Welcome to the Building Bite Podcast, a podcast for construction contractors, owners, and insurance professionals, where you can hear from the industry experts about key topics to help you be successful. My name is Peter Duggan. I'm here with my co-host, Mike Dierksen, and our guest, one of the industry's leading construction insurance experts, Gary Kaplan. Gary is the president of construction for Axe Excel the leading carrier in the SDI market space. Gary, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you for asking. Mike, how are you? Doing great, Peter. The topic today is building a successful insurance business, and nobody better to talk to about that than Gary. Gary, before we get into that main topic, let's talk a little bit about you. What we do know is you started the XXL construction business essentially from scratch, into a 100-person team, experiencing sometimes as much as 40% year-over-year growth, which as a business owner, I know can be tough to manage. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you got to where you are now? Sure. So I've lived in Chicago my entire life, uh, 64 years almost next month. I really ventured far away from here, and I went to school at Northern Illinois University, which is less than 60 miles away. I got my degree in chemistry, realized my senior year that I was going to bore myself to death working in a lab. (laughs) So uh, I went and got a job as a risk engineer for an insurance company called Industrial Risk Insurers which was interesting because I learned chemical engineering and I got to crawl around refineries and petrochemical plants. It was chemistry on a large scale. Very interesting. I did it for nine years and then I went into underwriting. I've been in the business now for, that that slide's a little outdated, 42 years. I worked my way into the underwriting ranks at the home insurance company, which then became Zurich. Spent many, many years at Zurich, 21 years, a lot of different roles that were, were fascinating and interesting. In 2010, I decided to leave there and I came to Excel at the time. It was called Excel in May of 2010 with a business plan to start up an all-inclusive construction business unit. Excel was not in the construction space right now, but they had a really, really big appetite. It was the perfect place to go. And I went there by myself. There was no business. It was just me. Worked on the business plan for six months, got the plan approved, and then I became a talent scout basically looking for people. The CEO at the time really liked some of the stuff I was doing that I'm going to show you and asked me to be a change agent for all of Excel at the time. So a lot of what you're going to see is the standard now in our company. Done a lot of work in uh, thought leadership, and, and I really, really am into this whole leadership planning and execution model. I did get published in Harvard Business Review in 1999. I got another article I'm about ready to submit that summarizes a lot of this work. Hopefully, they'll, they'll print it. But it's been an interesting journey. Uh, Like I said, it's the construction business at Excel is, we call it a vertical. It provides all of the property and casualty insurance products that a large contractor would want to buy. We started in 2011. First policy was 1111. I think there were five of us at the time, maybe. And we had a great first year. We wrote 56 million, which was twice what we were supposed to do. We started in New York and Chicago. And then over time, we spread out across the United States and Canada. I'm actually now responsible for Mexico and Brazil. We averaged about 40% annual growth, which was really, really remarkable. Slowed down a little bit in the last year because of the COVID. Uh, It hasn't changed the direction we're going. Um, AXA bought us about two and a half years ago, and we became the largest P&C insurance company in the world. Wow. That's really something, Gary. From a business school background myself or any entrepreneur would tell you, you know, the number one thing you need to figure out is your vision. So how did you come to that alignment? How did you settle in on that vision statement for this program? Great question and a really good lead in. um, You know, to get the business going, it was, like I said, it was just me and I had a project manager at the time. I didn't have any employees. So uh, I asked for volunteers, basically, from the rest of XL to come together at the Hyatt across the river there from where you're you're sitting, Michael. The uh, You can see it if you look out the window. You can see my office actually right behind your shoulder. There's a Hyatt over there. We did a workout in, uh, I think it was November of 2010. Had 30 people volunteer to come and partake in this. And over a course of two days, we came up with a a mini version of what I'm going to show you, which is uh, the plan, the work, work, the plan. And I think we had 13 projects that came out of that. We executed on those projects and lo and behold, we were ready to roll at 1-1 of 11. So the first thing we did was focus on this vision. And this is a little bit different from what we originally came with. The red stuff I recently added when I read the book, uh, Start With Why. But our, our vision was always to 
build the best all lines, that's the vertical construction risk solutions team, partnering with only the top contractors, that really narrows the scope of who we were going after. And then I added this other piece to successfully build and rebuild North America because it's in bad shape right now through construction projects. That was the vision that the team came up with at that time, and we stuck with it. Uh, I've often thought about getting rid of the build because we've done that, but uh, I I like the fact that we start with build because it's construction, right? And this is another thing that we came up with, kind of a really early version of what we thought the customers wanted from us. They clearly wanted the strength to protect them because sometimes we pay claims that are eight years old. Peter, you know that. We needed the agility to support them and they wanted creativity to help them grow. And then the last piece is really the most important. It is a relationship business. Construction companies are typically owned by the employees and you usually work with the CEO, the CFO, or the COO. So they have a real interest in that relationship piece. It's important to them. And the final piece was this, you know, it's a dedicated team focusing on understanding their needs by asking questions. We do a lot of training with uh, teaching our people how to ask good questions so they can figure out what it is the customer wants. And we think we provide really innovative products and services, help them maintain their profitability, their competitive edge, and, and get their employees home at night safely. That was the vision we st- set out and we stuck with it. We also came up with this, which I thought, you know, it changed over time. But like I said, it was one when I started. And now there's about 150 people on the team that support us. We're shooting for 800 million last year and we hit that. So that was good. We've written about four and a half billion to date which is a really big number for a startup PNC insurance company. And my goal, you know, is try to get to a billion in annual premium. We're getting close. I also want to have the greatest penetration of products for what we call the ENR 400. That's a magazine that's published weekly that lists the biggest contractors. And then I want to get back my number one rated by national underwriter that I had at my previous company. Those are kind of our big, hairy, audacious goals. Those are the things that we're constantly pushing ourselves to achieve. Gary, can you give us a summary on building a business from scratch? I absolutely can. I think that it starts with a well-thought-out business plan. I mentioned earlier, I think when you're starting from scratch, It is about becoming a talent scout, getting the very best people you can. It's kind of interesting, too, when you get some good people in the door, they bring in really good people, too. It spreads pretty quickly. We were hiring 15 people a a year for quite a long time. I think you need to develop a model of of how to lead, plan, and execute. Uh, I showed you guys that. Use a consistent process for implementing change. The rapid results initiatives are are perfect for, for that. Engage your team as much as possible in making the required changes. Get everybody in the team involved with the changes that you make. There was one survey we did a couple of years ago, an engagement survey, and we scored a 91 engagement score, which is unheard of. Yeah, we had no people disengaged. We only had maybe one that was in between. Focus on managing the utilization of your limited resources. You never are going to have enough people, but you got to make sure that they're doing the things that matter the most. So that's the operational plan. Keep coming back to that. And one thing we do really well in construction is we have fun. We just go out of our way to have fun. After every project, we have a celebration. Every billion dollar milestone, we take a half a day off and we all go out and have a good time together. So I think that's really important. That's what I would suggest. Gary, you're demonstrating here through all that you're telling us that you've got a brilliant business mind. And I think anybody that knows you knows that. One of the things that we found very interesting in talking to a lot of your team members is how seriously and how important the people on your team are to you. You mentioned something interesting when you started the business. You said you're a talent scout, or at least you started as a talent scout. Can you tell us a little bit about how you found the right people for XXL and how XXL people allow you to differentiate yourself in the marketplace? I used to tell uh, Mike McGavick was the CEO back in that day. And Serena Mog was the the woman that hired me over from my old company. She worked there too. And she had just been charged to take over the North American part of Excel. And I used to tell them both that the biggest risk in the plan was, was I going to get the right people? Because, you know, literally I was starting from scratch. There was nobody there, just me. It was very lonely for six months (laughs) because I like people around me. But that was the biggest risk was, could I attract the highest caliber people out there the industry. So I just started to make a list in Excel of everybody that I knew. 
I used LinkedIn. I used a couple of the conferences that I go to because they give you a list of the attendees. And I've been updating that thing for 11 years. I probably have the best database of construction insurance talent in the industry. I don't think anybody else does that. And when people move around, I update it. I keep track of where do they get their roots? What's their DNA? So I have a column in there. It says, where do they learn the business? Because I think some companies teach it better than others. I tend to go to the ones that have similar values to us. Something else I did from the very start, I read a book called The No Asshole Rule back in 2007. It really changed the way I looked at people and thought about people. And I brought that with me, that mentality. It's a really good book, by the way. There's a couple of them out there, but uh, they're all kind of the same idea. You don't want to hire any, you don't want to work with any, and you certainly don't want to insure any. Because when something goes wrong, you're going to have to work with those people. So I brought that with, it resonated with my leadership team at the time. We adopted it as a philosophy. You know, when we started looking at people, they had to have the right fit. I also have a column in that spreadsheet that says fit from one to five. And a five means they're going to fit in really well with everybody else. And we stick to that. We've, we've, uh, we've, we fired a couple of customers because they turned out to be that. Life's too short, you know, to work with people like that. So we don't. And uh, we turn down business all the time when we see signs of it. Sometimes you don't know until there's a claim, right? You find things out sometimes when you go through a claim. But that's our philosophy. That's what we stuck with. And we continue to stick with that. And it's served us really well. The team is highly engaged. They love working together with one another. That's a core part of the vertical is to get the teams to work together and look at the contractor holistically instead of separately. And you got to have the right people with the right mindset to make that work. And it's working really well for us. Yeah. So, Gary, starting with the vision, right? You set the vision. Then your talent scouted and got the best people. Then, as you're talking about, you want to make sure they work together. And you've talked to me several times about the Rapid Results Institute. I know you sit on the board there, and I know you deploy those methodologies in change management and getting those people to work together. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you deploy the Rapid Results Institute information? Sure. So Rapid Results Initiatives is a project process. It's something that I was introduced to in 1999 by my new boss and my new job back there in Schaumburg, Illinois. And it's just the perfect project process. It gets change management exactly right. Uh, this is a book that Robert Schaefer is the guy that founded Schaefer Consulting. I've been working with them since then. We've probably done over 500 rapid results initiatives at both the companies that I worked at. I was asked to join the board of the Rapid Results Institute, which was a guy named Nadim Mata that left Schaefer and started up a nonprofit focused on social reform. It's been really awesome to be on that board. But we apply that same methodology to try to solve things like youth homelessness in the United States, justice reform in Mexico, government reform in the UAE and then the UK. And we're probably going to go into climate change next when we find our new CEO, uh, Nadim, is going to retire at some point. So we're actively pursuing somebody right now. But what an RRI is, it's just a short term project, 90 to 100 days. It's very results focused versus activity based. It's just a great change management tool. There's a book by John Cotter called Leading Change, and he talks about the eight steps to be successful in leading change. This process has all eight of those steps as part of how it's done. It boosts people's morale. It enhances the participants' leadership skills. It improves organizational communication. The thing I like about it, it goes back to my background as a chemist. It tests critical assumptions like hypothesis. You could quickly find out whether you're right or wrong by doing this 90-day challenge. doesn't cost a lot of money. It's just people's time. Um, it absolutely inspires creativity and it spurs innovation. It's just a really, really great tool. And you can use it for anything. It works on almost anything. Gary, with using the RRI tools, how has that advance your leadership within AXA? Yeah, it's kind of funny, you know, over my career doing all those projects, you know, they almost always are successful, even if you don't hit the goal. What the team does in an RRI is they set their own goal. You as the sponsor set out a challenge. You ask them to help you figure something out. You empower them. You give them the accountability to work and figure it out. And what the team does at the end of a, of a brainstorming session is they, they, they narrow the scope and they set their own goal. 
It's a results-focused goal. And there's a lot of power in that. It's the thing I think that really makes them successful. People just get excited about it. They know it's only going to be 100 days. It's not going to be one of those projects that lasts for two years. You know, this is just a 90-day sprint. It brings out what we call zest factors. It, it gets people excited to try something new. I like it because it does a lot of the things that a lot of corporations are trying to do right now. It, it, like I said, it definitely brings out innovative ideas, creativity. It also takes advantage of inclusion and diversity because you're putting together these teams for a short period of time and you're asking them to share their perspectives, their opinions, and their experiences. That's what one of the major benefits of having inclusive and diverse teams is. So it just really works well. Uh, the thing that's frustrating though is that whether you hit the goal or not, you always learn something and you always change some process and then you build off of that. Even if the team doesn't hit the goal, you learn something and then you can follow it on with another RRI that will take it to the next level. The the frustrating part was that a lot of times we were having good success with this in construction and the rest of the organization struggled sometimes. And my boss would call on me and say, Gary, can you help this leader do an RRI? And I would do that and they'd be successful, but they would never do it again. It was very frustrating that they wouldn't adopt that mindset as RRIs, a stream of them as a way of driving continuous improvement. You're always improving your processes. So the thing that I came up with was coming up with an operational plan. When I came to Excel, all you had to do is leader was your financial plan. That was the only thing that was required. Most companies, you have to do that. And at the end of that, people would just roll into the new year. And the thing that was missing in my mind was this operational planning. And what it is, it's just a portfolio of projects that you can do as you're executing on that plan in the next year. So um, we would bring together the construction team in October once the financial plan was done. And I would challenge them to kind of come up with a portfolio of prioritized projects that would fit into this operational plan. We use the four levers of growth, profitability, expense, or productivity and talent as the key pillars of our strategy. And then I'd bring that team in and we'd say, all right, let's just use post-it notes and let's talk about what projects should we do next year and how should we sequence them so we're constantly stimulating performance so that we'll hit on that plan. And we defined a project as uh, something that involves three or more people and last three or more weeks just to get all the other stuff off the operational plan to make it crystal clear. And this is the process that we used. It was, it's really pretty simple. I remember the first one we did using post-it notes on a whiteboard. I asked each of the five members of my team to write down what projects they think they needed to do that next year in order for us to do stimulate that performance. And we would they would go up on the whiteboard and post them in a two by two. Pretty simple stuff, you know, urgency on the Y axis and importance on the X axis. And then we post it out. You can see the one we did there on a flip chart. And we used colored post-it notes to differentiate between the four levers. It made it easy then to organize the whole thing. The really cool part, once this is done, you put it into this PowerPoint slide and that's your operational plan. I mean, literally it's that simple. The ones up here in the right, top. Those are the most important ones. So hopefully you're going to do those in the first quarter. And then hopefully the ones in the bottom left quadrant are less important and they would be done once you got the other ones out of the way. And it always works. It's just a really good way. You could take this and you can roll it right into your performance goals because everyone that wrote a post-it note, that's their performance goal. Typically, they come up with five to eight projects during the year. And we'd have a portfolio of about 50 things we could do during the year to make sure we hit on the plan. And then I would review this thing. That's a really important thing. You can't just do this and let it sit in a drawer, which a lot of operational plans do. Uh, we review this every month when I pull my leadership team together. We look at the metrics we have in place. We look at the feedback we're getting from our people and we reprioritize based upon what it's telling us. If we're falling behind on growth, we'll do an, a growth project. If we're having issues with profitability, we'll do a profitability RRI. And we always do the productivity ones. We do that on an annual annual basis. We call it project one now at the company, but it's just a way of us going back and looking at all the processes that our people are doing every day and figuring out ways to improve them, which is really great. I mean, you're kind of like lean and Toyota. You're asking the people that are doing the processes, how can you improve them? And then you're using that 90 day project process, the RRI, to improve their processes, and improve their work environment. Uh, I think it really helps raise the engagement among the team. That's an excellent point, Gary. I mean, I know you just referenced the Toyota, the lean people over Toyota. On the RRI website, 
you know, they mentioned that you want to get those closest to the problem to solve the problem. And, you know, it sounds like that's something you guys are taking to heart. It's a mindset that you're really adhering to. So is there something in particular about that or who on your team are you pushing to solve those problems? Yeah, it's, that's a really great question. And in the early days, it was the same people that were doing all the projects. They were getting the sponsorship. I was usually the sponsor at the beginning. I worked that down to my leadership team. I taught them how to become sponsors. And then we started seeing the same team leaders used every time. And so people can burn out if you keep putting them on projects over and over and over. So we decided to use an Excel spreadsheet and we listed all the projects. Projects, we listed all the people and we tracked who was being used on the projects. And then I think it was the third year we got to the point where we were trying to get everyone on the team on at least one project one time a year. And we maintain that now. So almost everyone that works in the construction business will participate in at least one RRI per year. And we spread it around. I think it's really important. It goes back to that talent lever. Doing these projects, you're teaching people leadership skills. If they're the team leader, you're teaching them project management skills. If they're the facilitator or project manager, and you're teaching teamwork because you're pulling these teams together to work on really interesting challenges. And a lot of times they'll be cross profit center teams. I have five profit centers. A lot of times they're mixed people from each group. We bring in people from claims that we need to, or the actuaries or the risk engineers. So really good opportunities to drive that empowerment, that accountability, and giving people a voice in the changes that you need to put in place in order to be successful. Yeah, that's a powerful tool to be used, right? And from the ground up, right? You're talking about bringing people into the projects, giving them the, the platform to grow. So a quick question then, you know, Gary, what's a project that sticks out in your mind, one earlier on in your career that might have been a very formative project for you. I guess the most difficult project I ever got was in response to 9-11. I'll never forget that day because my boss was supposed to be on the phone with the CEO at the time, and he wasn't on the call. You know, I had pushed to set this up because I knew that the government backstop was coming and had a requirement that we had to be compliant in three weeks. We had 85 underwriting systems at the time, and changing all those in three weeks was nearly impossible. So I'm on this call, and, and he calls out for my boss. He's not there. So then he asks, for, he asks me, he says, Gary, you got this, right? I'm like, oh, my God, yeah, I got this. Okay. And I literally hung up the phone, and I freaked out because it was the biggest assignment I'd ever gotten. There were no answers because we basically had no terrorism exclusions back then. And we had to come up with them. We had to come up with ways of underwriting terrorism. I remember walking around that day, just grabbing people that I knew would be good and pulling them into this uh, steering committee. And I found people while I was leaving in the parking lot, I invited them in the next day. And you know what? Over that three-week period, we, we got it done. We got compliant. We had 100 people on the second floor in the meeting rooms stuffing envelopes. We moved fast and we got compliant. And when you get a project like that that's really scary, that's really way over your head, you should run to it because it can change your career. And that, that project really did change my career because I got recognized for the really good work that the team did. Uh, I was the spokesman, basically. You know, I just kept them focused, kept challenging them. And you know what? We got it done. And so I got a whole bunch of new assignments after that. Every two years, I was into some new assignment. New. Uh, I, I went to a couple of startups. Uh, it was. I was changing every two years. And, and I got some really tough assignments, but, you know, I kept running to them and we kept being successful. We would typically use the RRI process to solve those problems. And it works. Doing projects is a really powerful way of implementing change. Gary, implementing change requires leadership. And one of the things that folks like you and I face is a great young talent pool and how to tap into that talent pool and allow for opportunities for leadership. Starting at the base of that talent pool, that's the universities. And I know you go back oftentimes to speak to your alma mater. Is it a similar method that you deliver to those students? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There's a bunch of us that went to Northern Illinois that worked in the firm now. You know, you find that stuff out over time because they're all younger than me. But uh, I had this one young guy named Justin Gress. He was my chief operating officer. He was pretty active in the alumni. He went to the business school. I, I was in the school of, of chemistry, but he got this opportunity. He says, why don't we take this back to NIU and, and teach the business students? This is a really good use case or, you know, an example of how it works in action. So I think it was two years ago. Yeah. Two years ago, we went the day after the Super Bowl and we had the graduating business school class at uh, 
11 o'clock. And I kept thinking, this is going to be bad because it's the day after the Super Bowl. Who's going to want to hear us? And it was standing room only. There 80 people showed up. The place mm. was packed. Justin and I presented basically what I'm going to show you next, the model. And only one kid fell asleep. <laughs> He was out cold. He had his head down on the table. You know, he definitely had too many beers uh, at the Super Bowl. But the rest of the class loved it. And they invited us back the next year. We did it virtually the last two times. It's really fun to be able to share this with them. And we get really good questions from them. I think they get a good taste of, you know, what is it going to look like out there when I do go into the business world? We're doing it a lot lately. Justin and I have been doing it a lot in a lot of different places. So. If you move forward, okay, you're helping out those students, then you kind of get, let's say, five or 10 years in your career. Gary, as a young professional, what would be the advice you would give to me? I think the most important thing to move up the ladder and get more responsibility is you have to be able to take risk. Doing the terrorism project, that was a huge risk. But, you know, the more risk you take, the more success you can have and you get recognized for it. When you're younger, you're a little more risk averse because you got a big career ahead of you. A lot of years that you're worried about not getting fired, basically. So people tend to not want to take those big risks. I think the RRI process is awesome for that. It lets you narrow the scope of that risk. You're not spending a lot of money. You're not building an IT system. You're just leading people to come up with solutions. So getting on an RRI, being the team leader or the project manager is a really, really powerful way of showing that you can build teamwork, you can gain the team's trust, you can implement change in in a very low risk way. And I wish I had learned it before 1999. You know, I mean, literally that was halfway through my career. And uh, that was the pivotal year when I learned about this. I wish somebody had taught me this when I came into the business, because I probably would have used this methodology way earlier, the first 20 years. And uh, I think I would have been more successful than, than I was at that point. But it's a good leadership skill. And I think if you follow it, you're going to see the benefits. Gary, that's really powerful advice. You know, something I'm certainly going to take to heart as well you know, as a young professional myself. One thing that stands out to me when speaking with you, Gary, you know, we've, we've messaged several members of your team. As you said, Axe is one of the largest PNC providers in the world. And so in talking with your team, they've all indicated that you have been a very powerful and instrumental leader for their development and their growth. Specifically with the Women in Leadership series that we're hosting, everyone top to bottom has listed you as a pivotal leader for them. What does that mean to you to be recognized in that way by your team? Well, it feels great that you're hearing that. I don't necessarily hear that all the time directly, but that's kind of how it goes. You know, mm-hmm. uh, the whole women in leadership thing is is a big deal right now, but it's been a big deal for me for a long time. Back then in 99, we had a team that was half women and they were great and they performed super on projects. But I recognized that they weren't in as many leadership positions as they should be. And I, I remember I started a women in leadership program with an RRI, actually. We, we used an RRI to get that going. And I've been doing that all along the way. I think it's a, teaching them these same skills is really important. And Gary, you've put an entire process together about all these things that you're talking about. Can you tell us a little bit about that process model? Sure. When I came to Excel, we had these behaviors that were the core values of the company. And then when AXA bought us, they gave us their core values and they matched up really well. I mean, they're different words, but they're the same things that we should aspire towards. And along with that, we had our commitments and our leadership essentials. So a lot of really good words on a piece of paper that people don't go back and look at very often. I kept thinking there needed to be a process or a model that would bring this stuff to life. And that's when I came up with the leadership planning and execution model. This is the whole notion that throughout the year, you're building a plan. And then at the same time, you have to execute on the plan that's in place. And these two components, these two things go on simultaneously. You can see where I actually started with the operational planning piece. And then I kind of worked backwards. I then put in place a, a means of updating the strategy every year so that you'd have a really crisp strategy when you went into the financial planning season. It would give you the direction on what your financial plan would look like. And then you could follow that up with the operational plan. And then I went even further back into the why piece. So now we do an annual January business direction session. And then in the months between that And the business strategy update, we do competitor analysis. We come up with a SWOT, really good management practices that people don't consistently do. Now we have a timeline and we have those milestones throughout the year where we do those things. So we come up with a really powerful operational plan. And at the same time, 
at the bottom part where you're working the plan, we're sequencing those RRIs. We're pulling those project levers. We're doing workouts. We're doing operational reviews. And at the very bottom, we're getting this continuous stream of feedback through the metrics we put in place and through our monthly communications and one-on-ones to tell us what's going on with that plan. Where are we at? What do we need to work on? And we resequence and we reprioritize so that we're doing the right work that helps us hit on those milestones and hits on those targets. It's why we consistently perform above what's in the plan. Is this the action we might see in the Harvard Business Review article? It is. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Good stuff here. Gary, there's so much to consume here. This has been excellent. I guess I have one question for you from an action item perspective. What would you say to the audience? Go do this tomorrow. I think the one thing is to work on is your decision making and, and how you think about decision making. I think I read it in the Harvard Business Review one time about how decisions get made. And frankly, it it just depends on how much time you have to make that decision. If it's really urgent, it's almost always better to just make up your mind, try something, go one way or the other, put the feedback loop in place so you know whether you've made the right decision or not. And if you haven't, pivot and go the other direction. But if you have the luxury of time, get as many people involved as you can. That That's the whole notion of inclusion and diversity is the more opinions and thoughts, the better your decision is going to be. We actually do that twice a year. I have an extended leadership team now, which is my leadership team and the middle managers. And we pull them together to update that strategy in May. And we, then we pull them together at the end of the financial plan to build the operational plan. So I'm getting all that feedback from our team. And I think we're making better decisions. And there's a lot more ownership when you do it that way. They feel like they developed the strategy. They feel like they know what they need to execute in order to hit that plan. You get huge buy-in when you do it that way. Man, what I hear from you over and over, the themes, Gary, are people, 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 how to give people opportunity, how to show them how to be leaders, how to help them make decisions. Excellent stuff. I got a few fun speed round questions for you. You ready? Yeah. All right. Number one, what's something that people might be surprised to learn about you? If people know me, there's nothing that they don't know about me because I'm pretty much of an open book. But I guess the one thing that is kind of unknown, but there's a documentary about it out there on the streaming services. Uh, When I went to school in the 70s, there wasn't much to protest against. You know, it was a pretty peaceful time, so to speak. Right. So the one thing, though, that bothered me when I went to NIU is uh, disco was coming in. We were rock and rollers. You know, all, all the people I hung around with were rock and rollers. Disco was sneaking in. They were putting in those ridiculous floors with lights in all the bars. It was awful. The clothes that we were wearing back then, terrible stuff. And I had this one guy that was a roommate that was in the local paper, and he had an idea that we should organize a disco protest. So we pulled together all our buddies. We got the Red Lion to uh, sponsor this. We invited all of the uh, frats and we organized the first disco protest in the United States. It got picked up on the wire, ended up in the third page of the Sunday Tribune here in Chicago. So it got a lot of attention. We had a lot of fun doing it. Then this local DJ named Steve Dahl picked up on it. He called us that Monday after the weekend and said he wanted to do it again. And we said, well, no, we just did it, you know. But anyway, he interviewed us for a while and then he took the idea and he did the disco demolition that summer at the White Sox Park, Comiskey Park. In between a double header, he had this promotion. Bill Veck ran the White Sox back then. He was a really creative guy. And if you brought a disco record, you got to get into the game for free. And they collected all those records to put them in center field and they blew them up. But what happened is they set a record for the attendance at that thing because everybody got in for free and it was hot. And people started frisbee in the records, which was really dangerous because, you know, they're sharp. And once they blew them up, the fans went nuts because there were too many people in there and they all ran onto the field. And if you see the documentary, people are just running around like chaos. And uh, they forfeited the second game. It was it was really funny. I saw <laughs> I ran into Steve Dahl at a Bears game and I asked him if he remembered us and he, he did not. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like you're a little more Rolling Stones than Bee Gees. Am I right about yeah, that? Yeah. <laughs> One more for you. You're a huge Chicago sports fan, true? Yes. Favorite Chicago sports memory? There's been a lot. And I'd say uh, I struggle with that one. The teams were so bad in the early part of my life that anytime they won a championship, that was like so big. And, you know, it, I mean, the Cubs took 50 or 100 years. The White Sox had been 50 years. The Blackhawks had been a, a really, really long time. And, and then the Bulls, you know, with the six championships in seven years, that was a pretty amazing time. But I got to say the one thing was the 85 Bears. You know, it was my second year as a season ticket holder. I went to every game. What a 
interesting, interesting team, you know, the Super Bowl shuffle and McMahon and Mike Singletary. Uh, I, my license plates for the longest time were Bears 50. I got the opportunity to hire Mike to do a keynote for us. And I got to interview him for two hours. It was amazing. So I, I would say the 85 Bears. I mean, they're all over my office here. <laughs> yeah, great documentaries about them as well. Um, yeah. I know ESPN had a great 30 for 30 on them. Well, Gary, as you might know, kind of wrapping this up, the podcast is called The Building Bites. That's BIM Insurance Technology with the Experts. But we do like to ask, you know, what are you taking a bite out of today? I know you got a, your Chicago guy. Is it going to be Chicago dogs or you know, deep dish? What's on the menu today for you? I struggle with this question too. Like, it's like, there's a place in town here in Naperville called Maison Sabica. It's a, a mm-hmm. Spanish tapas place. And the food there is just amazing. And it really fits well into my new diet, which is eat half of whatever you get served. <laughs> so, you know, the, the tapas is really tiny bits of food. So you don't, mm-hmm. you don't overeat. And uh, Rose Hall, who works with me, she's the chief of innovation. She started something called Tech Tapas, which I absolutely love. I think she'll talk to the group later about it. So I'm going to go with that. The other thing probably is sushi. Uh, The sushi place about two miles from here opened 15 years ago. And I don't think we've missed a Friday night in those 15 years. We always go there. It's kind of like cheers. My wife and I love that stuff. So those two, Wild Tuna and Mason Sabika. That is the best side I've ever heard. Just half of whatever they serve. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's Cut a lot in a cookbook somewhere. It's mm-hmm. amazing how, you know, if you eat half of what you used to eat, you lose weight. It just <laughs> falls off. That's the chemist in Gary right there. Yeah. Right, right. Testing that theory. Sophisticate. Yeah, sophisticated chemistry. Gary, thank you so much for chatting with us today. If the listeners want to hook up with you, want to chat with you, have a few questions for you about the stuff you shared today, how do they find you? You can just email me at gary.kaplan at axaxl.com. Wonderful, Gary. Thanks again. All right. Good seeing you guys. Thank you for listening to The Building Bite. This podcast has been brought to you by Proactive. Check us out on thebuildingbite.com where you can subscribe to our newsletter and follow us on social media for all future The Building Byte news and updates. You can also find us on your favorite apps, including Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, and Amazon. If you have ideas for episode topics that we should cover on the show, or you know somebody who would be a perfect guest, let us know at connect at thebuildingbyte.com.